everyone, welcome to Jacob City Fishing's Theology episode. If you are new, please click the subscribe button below and select the option to receive notifications when new episodes are created. Let's jump into some theology. I hope you learn and enjoy. Why don't we, uh, we can get praying and started and um, we're going to do things a little bit differently tonight. So, um, Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this night. Thank you for the opportunity to come together. I know it's been tedious. Um, just the, the monotony of the same things going on every day due to the, the quarantines and the frustration of the life changes that have had to take place because of it. I ask that you would help us uh, hone in our thoughts, uh, that you would help me uh, to, to teach and allow this to be a class where uh, you are the center, God, that you can guide us, that you can help us understand your word, and that you can be glorified in us and through us. Uh, bless our family members uh, or friends uh, or even those that may have, have gotten sick, um, that you would heal them. Um, bless this time. Uh, may it be a peaceful and joyful time uh, and, and one that we can look to you in thanks and praise. We love you so much and we give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. So to start, as always, um, our overview. Uh, prayer, checking in, class overview, our steps, background, over, the overview of 1 Corinthians. Uh, let me put that in here. Just to keep that the same. Uh, her, the actual application and the Q&A in conclusion. So tonight, um, we'll first check in, and I'll, I'll give you kind of a note um, on what's going to be different this week. But how are you guys holding up for the week? I honestly didn't do Jack Diddley. <laughs> yeah. I, 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 w I was just, I looked at it and I went, this is too much for me to work on right now. Okay. So, Overwhelmed? Uh, well, a little bit, but then there were a whole bunch of other things that, and then tr I was trying to get your stuff offline and I was having a hard time. So I had to call my computer guy and he tried and I finally just printed it off from my phone. Okay. That, was, that was the only way I was able to get it off. By the time I got it off, then something else happened. So, I got gotcha. you. Well, feel free to give me a call and let me know if you need help. All right. Yeah. It's just, I need to get my head back into it. That's all. I understand. Anybody else? Yeah. I have to be honest. Um, this is truth telling time. This is not something that you wait until the last minute to do. Oh, yeah, no. <laughs> no. no. Um, and that's what I did. And because I left the last meeting not quite understanding how to um, outline myself, actually. Yeah. Outline a chapter. So I kind of left it off. I did get my antiquity book in the mail, which was great. So I, read, I read the whole things on first, first Corinthians and that, and I read Corinthians, first Corinthians once again, and I read chapter, what are we on four? Yep. Um, so I did do that, but I did not get to outlining. When it comes to outlining, it just is like, I don't even know where to start. There's just seems like there's so many things to do with it. So I understand. And tonight you'll get some practice. Okay. So we're, my goal tonight to let everybody know is to go through this with you, this process. Oh, that'd be great. So no. I, I know we went through the book and the, the chapter, I mean, but, and I can give you all the information of, you know, what he talks about and stuff. And I'll give you some things that he discusses, but you need to know why you're doing this. And I wanted to be able to work together with you guys to guide you into, okay, this is how the thing, these are the things that you can think of and in the processes that you go through in order to create an outline, in order to, to understand and study scripture. So my goal tonight is to actually guide you through this process. Okay, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah that's great. I so. started, I'm really good at outlining normally, but I looked at it and then I went, this is way too much right now. <laughs> <laughs> I get it. I understand. Mary said, and I said too, you know, it's, 
it's not a, a beginner's course. No. Intermediate course. And we were overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's the hard thing with the book because it presents itself as a beginner's, you know, a book. My gosh, if this is beginners, what yeah. is what is 301 as opposed to 101? <laughs> it gets way more complex than this. Oh my gosh. But but when you get into those realms, it's more of you know word syntax and, and understanding the languages more like you know knowing the difference between a participle like what knowing what a participle is. And how that fits in a sentence and, you know, is it adjectival? Is it verbal? Like, you know, getting into some of those details. And I'm not here to do that. I don't know that much. Um, I'm here to just lay the groundwork, as I said. And I know the first couple of weeks have been overwhelming and I understand that. Uh, but that is, it, it is the initial blast. And then from here on, I think it'll, it'll start to level out. So... Okay. Okay. I'm going to take your word for it. I trust you, Sam. <laughs> so, absolutely. How's the rest of your week for everybody else? Hopefully it'll get better. <laughs> I kind of put it off a little bit. Um, I listened to the whole chapter on the treadmill. I like was listening to it out loud, but reading with it as well. So yeah. that was, and I, my goal, I couldn't get off the treadmill until I was done with it. That was my goal. Like, <laughs> <laughs> nice. it must have been out there for a while. <laughs> it, was, it was five minutes total. Um, how, lo and how long? 65 minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. One through 16. Um, and then I read through it. I tried just listening to the audio from for one through four a couple times throughout the week while I was doing something else, but obviously that didn't go so well. Um, but then I actually sat down and then, but I did, instead of doing like an outline, I did more like about, I wrote more details about like the people, about Paul's person, because there's those questions in the book about like Paul's attitude towards it. Yep. The people. Um, so then I wrote some stuff for each chapter. Yes. Yeah. And that's, that's part of this process. So yeah, when we'll hit, we'll definitely hit on that. Okay. So anybody else? Well, I had read the whole first or the, yeah, the, the whole chapter or the book last week. So that I didn't have to do, but then I did the one through four a few times, like I said, and I did ask myself the questions that it had on uh, page 67. Yep. Like, what do we think it means and why did he say it? So I did that um, through one through four. Excellent. But then as far as like digging in further, um, using, you know, other things, I didn't get that far. But That's fine. That's yeah. fine. I wanted to do more, but you run out of time. <laughs> yes. And I, I, part of this is understanding once, once you do begin to get this process and you're putting it into practice, it becomes easier. And so... It, it becomes more normal. So when I read, for example, when I go through First Corinthians, I'm already thinking of some of these questions. You know, did his thought process change in this conversation? Why did it change? What was he trying to get at? You know, is this still part of the same argument as he was just getting through? Um, or is this something new that he's bringing up? Uh, questions like that are already going through my mind because I've just done it more frequently. Mm -hmm. So, um, and it'll become more and more like that as you go. Who's that, Nancy? Everybody else? I got to about the same um, point as I, that I did start researching a little bit deeper. Um, but just need, I think, more. I don't know how yet, quite yet. Okay. <laughs> don't know how to get any deeper than what I did. So. No, that's a, that's a great step or place to be. Jake, were you saying something as well? I kind of jumped in last week, um, but I, I read through First Corinthians and I did like a quick little uh, outline um, on each chapter as well in the section. 
um, but I still haven't seen the first two videos, so I'm just, I, I, I read through First Corinthians and, and just did an outline of it, my Perfect. understanding of it. Excellent. Yeah, that'll be good. So, yeah, going back will help. It might, it'll add a little bit more to some of the background that we're, we're talking about and why it can be somewhat overwhelming, but yeah, it'll be helpful. Sam, the cool. information that you sent us, um, like the, the background, was that from your antiquity book? It is, yep. Oh, okay. So I wanted to make sure you guys had some information. If you guys don't have any commentaries or anything like that, I wanted to give you guys some, some um, options. Um, and so I scanned that in and, and sent that over to you guys. Very nice. Thank you. And I missed the one now. Download, so I got to download the other part too. It's all good. Yeah, absolutely. So one note, um, I think that was everybody. One note for everybody on May twentieth, my wife's birthday is that day, so we will not be meeting that week. So you'll get a week off to relax and to breathe, and you know, play catch up. Yeah. <laughs> so. Oh, no. I'm sorry. <laughs> So I'm, I'm took a I took a couple of days off and I'm going to take the kids and let her get a break. She does a lot and she doesn't get many days off. So um, since we homeschool anyway, <laughs> I want to make sure she can relax and as much as she can. That's very nice. Thank you. So, um, does she know that? Yes, she does. She's aware. <laughs> yeah. If she's a planner, if I don't, if, if I don't tell her that something's coming up, it'll, it'll be bad. <laughs> so, um, yeah. So to dive in, the steps that we talked about, just a review, um, you, these are the thing, the questions that we wanna ask. Find out as much as you can about the people in the audience. Um, how does Paul come to learn of their situation? What kind of relationship uh, and former contacts has he had with them? What attitudes do they, do they and he reflect in this, in this letter? Um, try to reconstruct the situation to, to which the author is speaking. You know, why did they write the book? Um, develop a habit of reading through the text the whole way in one sitting. Uh, this should be somewhat normal. Obviously, you know, I don't have time to always read a book through the whole way. I mean, Corinthians, Romans, Acts, Revelation, these books have, you know, chapters upon chapters. Um, so sitting down and reading through the whole thing can be difficult. Um, but if I have enough time to watch a movie or do something like that, then I have enough time for this. It's usually more wanting to give time to my family at that point than anything. But um, I am trying to be in the practice of reading the whole thing. Some, and then when you get into Genesis or Exodus or those books, it obviously can get even more challenging. Um, oh, yeah. yeah. Um, so take brief notes when you read. Um, question the, the, form, the literary format, what genre it, is it? Um, as I said, ask for, for Paul's attitudes. Um, what do you know about the recipients, their responses to things, um, the specifics around, uh, the specific occasion of the letter, um, the letters, natural and logical divisions. So that's some of the, the uh, part of the focus we'll have here. And then the author's relationship with the audience. Has he been there? What's his attitude towards them? Um, and then basically repeat those same things with smaller segments. So as you read through a book, it, you'll see the, the, the train of thought for a book change and, or a letter I should say, or whatever the case may be, you know, segment it out like that. After you read it through a couple of times, break it down into those smaller segments and then read it through again. And just make it that focus time. Like, you know, pick a book a month and just go through this process and just focus on a book a month, something along those lines, you know, it's a way to make it more normal in your life. Um, so the next steps, so background. So what we are going to do tonight is we are going to make it more personal with you guys. So what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to, we're going to start with the background. Tell me some background on first Corinthians, whether that's the physical location, the, what was going on at the time, um, the letter, whatever the case may be, um, what have been your observations with this? Um, and let's start putting this now into practice. 
Mm. It was a booming metropolis. Okay. Yeah. Oh, hold on. There's a minute. All right. Let's see if I can read or write. It's in an O. Bola. Yeah. There you I, go. I'm 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 an awful speller. Luckily, I have spell check, so don't mind me. That's all right. All right. What else? It had both wealthy and poor people in it. Okay. So there was a mix between wealthy and poor. Worshiping idols. A lot of people. Well, I guess spell check isn't always the best. Yeah. It was the capital city. Capital city for what? Uh, for, oh, I'm going to butcher this. Uh, Achaia? Achaia. Right, right there. Right there. Yep. Yeah. Good job. There you go. Yeah. Uh, side note to that is that was uh, essentially Greece. And you're going to get, a, you, as always, you'll get this in the end. So all of these notes and stuff, you'll be able to keep so that when the next time you read Corinthians, you'll be able to go through, you'll be able to have these. Oh. Would you say that? Wait, what was that? Enough Jews for a synagogue? There was enough Jews for a synagogue? That's what Mary said, yes. Okay. A lot of sexual immorality. A lot of sexual immorality? Yeah. I'll put that under... Keep going. Do you name it? I'll keep adding it. Uh, Latin was used for business, uh, but Greek, yeah, but they spoke Greek most times. And, and remember, we're doing this together. Take your time, see what you can find. They argued amongst themselves. They argued amongst themselves? Mm -hmm. You mean the, the Corinthians? Correct. You, the church you're talking about, correct? Yes. What did they argue about? Um, well, they were arguing about which apostle was um, the most important, and that started dividing them into factions. I feel like they also argued about um, just their beliefs in general. Like what? Um, I don't remember where. Did they? I don't understand the whole spirit. Jesus. There was a lot of dissension. Oh, a lot of dissension, Mary said. About who they followed. About who they followed. Yep. Apollos, Paul, Jesus. Yep. Anything else about the land or, or um, the letter itself that you guys can think of? Well, it was on a sea, so they okay. they had a lot of um, traffic from all over 
I mean, they, they, they were a, a melting pot there that everybody came there. It was kind of like Jerusalem. <laughs> yeah, it was a port city. Um, so they had a lot of traffic. They would actually, at times, because of the way that it was, the uh, Ismet was, they would actually transport ships from one side of Corinth to another on cement railways in order to, to move them from one side to the other and travel east or west. Because if you went around, uh, it was, uh, I believe, an additional four or six days uh, of travel time, and it was very dangerous. So this was the easiest way to get around, and a lot of people went through it. It was the master of two harbors. One led to Asia, and the other led to Italy. Yep. Okay. So, go ahead. So some of the, the observations I have as well, um, to throw it in here. So Paul arrived in Corinth during his second missionary um, journey. So you can see Corinth way over here, um, uh, where the green, light green side is above Crete on the Mediterranean. Um, it was, as we've discussed before, and I took some of it from what we did before and then some from other, other locations, it was a young city, uh, only about 94 years old uh, when Paul first, first visited it. it. It's on an isthmus, as was said, in, uh, between mainland Greece and Peloponnesus. It, is, it was the capital of Achaia and the seat of the Roman proconsul. Um, at the time, Ionius Gaio, who was Seneca, uh, he was a great philosopher, his brother, uh, he was the proconsul during the time. So if you wanted to know more about what politically was going on during Paul's time there, you could look him up and you can find more information about, hey, what, what was it like living there politically um, at the time? Like, you know, just as today, you know, we, we have Trump as a president, we have liberals, Democrats, you name it, in the government, and we have books that talk about what's going on during this time. And that is an impact on how we live and our normal lives. Um, let's see, and Paul stayed there 18 months, and during that whole time, Gaia was the, the proconsul. It was a strategic location for commerce, and it was mostly colonized by freedmen, plebeians, which are just the common Roman citizens. Um, oh, and I put that on wrong. Let's swap that. Um, and Roman legionary veterans, um, as, as well as slaves. Um, it was actually looked pretty... <coughs> down upon after it was cap captured because um, the, the way of living, the political realm, the wealth of it was actually lowered when Rome took it over and changed it um, and took all the people out of it and resupplied it with people. Um, it was still very wealthy. Um, it was a patron of the arts. The Ismian Stadium was there and they, they hosted the games, um, which, you know, when you get into First Corinthians, when it talks about earning the wreath, um, understanding what was going on in that type of analogy and how they would understand a race, um, uh, whether it's Second Corinthians or First Corinthians, you know, the things that it discusses, he uses analogies that circumstantially they would have understood. It was cosmopolitan and wealthy, a patron of the arts. Uh, he said that um, it was a religious city, 26 temples and shrines. Uh, it included the temples of uh, Asclepius, Demeter, Kor, as well as others. Um, that's not by any means uh, all that was there. Um, it was well known for its sensuality. However, there were, there were still rules. So this is something interesting I found too. Both scripture and the Roman culture denied the ability to marry one's stepmother or mother-in-law. You know, we see 1 Corinthians 5. We're not going to get into that tonight. But where it talks about Paul saying, like, not even the Gentiles agree with what's going on well he, there are some specific quotes the institute of gaius and pro uh i forgot the o there um cluentio um they there are quotes from them saying hey it is actually socially wrong 
to marry or have relations with your stepmother or mother-in-law. And um, it's interesting because the quotes actually from the, the Greek side really hone really in on the woman, woman, that the woman is the one that's being absolutely disgusting because of the act, not the man. Um, so it, it is an interesting situation, you know, how Paul actually says, put him out of the church. Um, his circumstances are wrong. So um, just socially, the circumstance of holding a man accountable for something like that would have an impact. Um, lastly, and, and some things that I found, the Stoics and Cynics disagreed on marriage. You kind of have something going on philosophically with marriage. And so this is going to you know, make you think of 1 Corinthians. The Stoics thought maintaining the relationship was a harmonious thing to do with the universe, while uh, the cynics desired to be free and to have these types of relationships without marriage, to be unencumbered. And, and so there, there was social dissension in views towards marriage and whether I, one should stay married. Marriage. I have a question. Yeah, go when ahead. you say Stoics and cynics, are you saying like a Stoic person or a cynic person? No, they were f types of philosophers. But they don't mean anything like the word Stoic or cynic? I I, they they come from very I mean obviously our our usage of the words are you know derived from them but okay. these are the groups the philosophical groups of the time I see so um, yeah both as you can tell are very humanistic in their views you know the one on on the one hand the Stoics wanting to be harmonious with the universe and that leads into marriage so if you get married you stay married and that's in harmony with what's going on in the universe the cynics they just they wanted to live free and be ph philosophical without any limitations and you know that these are kind of the things that socially they were dealing with and so you wonder then the questions that they had about marriage about betrothal you know, maybe they, there was social pressure in these areas based off of the people that were around them, right? And so, so these types of things are going to make us think more deeply about the circumstances and how they could influence the letter that Paul received and that he's responding to. All that making sense? Mm -hmm. Yes. So that's obviously one of the first steps. You know, you can either, as you're looking up, um, the background of a location like uh, Philippian or Philippi or Corinth, Corinth or whatever the case may be. These are things to keep in mind. And luckily, as I said, the antiquities book, for example, gives a lot of these insights. You know, you can start seeing, you know, hey, why would a question about somebody marrying their stepmother be an issue? Like, and having relations with her. Um, when you see socially that it was even looked down upon and Paul's response is so severe that, you know, now you can align yourself and say, oh, wait, yeah, really, that it was socially wrong, not just within the, the scriptures, but also just generally people thought this was wrong. And it was obviously happening. There were, there's some other background that if the husband died, all of the wealth would go to the other parts of the family because it was very, um, uh, what's, what's the word? Uh, patristic. Um, and so if the father died, all the money would be transferred to el elsewhere in the family. And so if the mother or stepmother married the, the son, the money could stay in the family, but it was just looked down upon, obviously. I mean, we look down upon it too. So, um, but give some insight. Does that make sense? Is this helping to some degree to, to think through um, some of the, the questions and the things that can come up socially in that area. Yes. Yes. And I highly recommend that antiquity book. I just, like I said, I just got mine. And for me, who barely, who knows nothing, it's wonderful. It's got yeah. pictures and everything. Yep. <laughs> so the, the two books, or the two maps up here of Corinth are from my antiquities book. And this map is actually from my Lagos Bible software. So, um, it helps me understand, you know, here's the isthmus and that the ships would come sailing in and could it be transported right here uh, and move over to the Corinthian Gulf and then sail west without having to go all the way around and deal with the dangerous waters. Um, or even further, when you look at it from a bigger picture, you have all of these islands and stuff down here. It was just a dangerous place to, to, to sail. So all this money, all this, all of this uh, profit 
went right into Corinth because of their uh, physical location. So, excellent. All right. You guys, are, so are you guys com a little more comfortable with background stuff now? Yes, as you explain it, Sam. Excellent. So from here, then you can do this either, I, I usually would do this in parallel, understanding the background while reading through it. Um, we do it, we're gonna do an overview. So some of you guys did the whole overview of the book, some of you didn't. This is, this is my overview in, uh, in large. Um, I break mine down a little bit differently than the author just because I usually put greetings in separate areas. Um, and from what I've, when I've studied, I think that there's actually three different things going on, not just two. Um, when it comes to Chloe's um, people telling Paul about stuff and then the Corinthians telling him about stuff, I think there's more going on than that based off the text and some other studies I've done. But I'm going to work with you guys now. For those of you that have started it, and even if you haven't, this is a place to begin. When you were reading through 1 Corinthians, what were the breaks that you guys saw um, within the book? Well, the first one, obviously, is we reading. Okay. Give me the verses, and then I will put that in. So it's uh, 1 Corinthians 1. Um, uh, 1 through 9. 9? Nine. 9, yes. Like she said. All right, so a greeting. What's next? You know, it's really hard to take and break it down because it, it's broken down for you in the book already. Yeah. And that's, that, I, I, it's, it's kind of na a natural break. It's, it's showing you how it's broken down. But when I printed, when I printed it off, first I started printing each chapter separately. But then when I got up to six, I said, this is ridiculous. <laughs> And then I, it, it took it, it just, it printed off every, everything like together, like a jumble, but it still broke it down. Yeah, I get it. And that, th see, that can be the danger of using some of these books sometimes is we immediately go down to the segmentation that they bring to the text. And then we're, we, we just bite into this is what they think it is. And so I'm just going to trust that they do it, which, you know, it's not bad. Um, if you're beginning, it, it's a good place to start. But I, that's why I, I recommended, you know, do this yourself before looking at, over what was written in the book because you need to have a thought process behind it. When somebody asks you a question and you're looking to give wisdom to others, you need to be able to break down these passages and, and think through, okay, you know, it's talking about wisdom and it's and discernment when it comes to division or let's, let's take the divisions. That's even better because especially today um, it's talking about divisions in the church. You know, you believe in Paul and Apollos and all these people. Well, obviously, Paul thinks that there is doctrine that is outside truth based off of some of these things um, that he says here as well as elsewhere in the New Testament. But here his problem is here are these believing servants of God and they're dividing over who's right, even though they're all believers and they're being divisive. The problem isn't the apostles. The problem is their division. So when I read through that, I can look at that and say, okay, the, then one of the issues that Chloe's people is bringing up is division in the church and support founded by arrogance. They're prideful. And throughout the book, what you find is the Corinthian church is really, really prideful. Um, and it comes out in various ways. And in this case, you know, as I read through it, I see that, you know, as, the way I broke it down, I didn't have it here. But the way I broke it down is problem one is divisions in the church. Solution one, two, three, et cetera, et cetera, is following that. And he be begins to provide solutions for Hey, there's divisions in the church. What is this actually looking like? How, what is this really as far as their sin goes? And what are their, what's the solution to these things? And he really discusses those things as he follows through with each 
thought that Chloe brings up, or Chloe's people, I should say. Um, but all that to be said, I, I want to encourage you before you, you, these tools are wonderful, um, but before you, you memorize their section breakdown, whether it's in your Bible or there, think through those things yourself. Understand the letter yourself or what's written yourself before you get to that point. They are tools to help you understand the thought process, and they will articulate why they did it the way that they did. Um, but I, 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 our goal tonight is to hear you guys. What, what are the things that help you understand the breaks in the text as you read through this so you can start practicing um, putting together an overview of a book for yourself? So what, what would be, for example, the next breakdown? It's a pretty big one. I mean, the way that it, I, I agree with him on this one as I've read through it. Excuse me, read through it. Is it 10 through 17? The, so the, the, you, I, I, I'm talking on the larger scale, but are you meaning 110 to 117? Oh, yeah. As far as the yeah. paragraph? I was, yep. Okay, let's, let's broaden it out a little bit more. Is there a bigger section in mind? Divisions of the church. Okay, there's various divisions of the church. Um, what about, so the for, in verse 10, verses 10 through, let me get my Corinthians out. Uh, verse uh, 10 through 17, you get this introduction that Chloe's people have brought some things up to Paul, right? Right. So has there been a time, as you read through 1 Corinthians, where somebody else brought something up? Well, they were all tell saying that they belong to different people. Okay. Yeah. That's the first thing that, that Chloe's people, that he want, that Paul wants to discuss with them, that, that are, there are divisions in the church regarding the apostles. What about, turn to chapter seven for me real quick. Chapter seven. Way to have to come there. Uh -oh. Yep. <laughs> so are the you talking about sex? Um. No, but that, that, that's, part of a separate argument uh, dealing with a different issue okay so okay concerning okay. marriage so what's the first verse in chapter seven say it says now for the matters you wrote about which means that they wrote them a letter previously. Ex exactly so chapter seven verse one can you read that one more time now for the matters you wrote about yeah so oh, yeah. all from chapters 110 to the end of chapter six we have various topics that Chloe's people has brought up, right? Mm -hmm. There's never anything else within chapters one through six where Paul's like, you know, and, you know, uh, Lucius brought up X, Y, and Z in chapter four. And, and Simeon brought up A, B, and C in chapter six. What we have is chapters one through six, there are chapters one, verse 10, over to the end of chapter six, this whole plethora of things that were told to Paul by Chloe's people about what was going on at Corinth. Does that make sense? Yeah. And he makes that clear by the way that he wrote about it. When you look at chapter seven and you hear now, uh, now concerning the things that you, the matters about which you wrote about all of that before should make you think, okay, Chloe's people brought all of those things up. That's whole, one whole thought process. He's addressing issues that Chloe's people brought up. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In one through six. Yep. Because let's take a look at each chapter just to give some clarity. So one, chapter one, verse 10 says, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the ju same judgment. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there is quarreling among you. So he starts there. And then chapter two. And I, when I came to you, brothers, did not come proclaiming the testimony of God. Well, if you look, if you studied the beginning of chapter two, you see, well, that's actually connected to the argument still at the end of chapter one. He's still discussing right. that. Right. So let, then let's, moving ahead to chapter three. But brother, I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people. Well, He's still discussing this, another part of the argument, it appears, prior to that. And I'm just using the, the chapter markers. You, 
typically you would go paragraph by paragraph to see these links um, as you study, as you read through it. Chapter four, this is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. And you see, okay, this is kind of still talking about that, uh, the steward issue. And he, he goes on, moreover, it's required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you. And he continues on. He's like, he's still discussing the division about people there. Mm -hmm. So chapter five, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you. Well, you see, it's actually reported. Well, who would that report be referring to? Right. Probably back to Chloe, right? Right. And so he keeps that in mind. Chapter six. When one of you has a grievance against one another, does he dare go to law? Again, divisions in the church. He's still bringing up things that were divisive in the church. And <clears throat> there's nothing here to think that he's referring to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And then chapter seven comes along. Now, concerning the matters about which you wrote. Who's you? Who, who do you think? Holy. Oh. The church. Chloe's people or whoever the people were. So I hear Chloe, Chloe's people. I hear the church. Which one do you guys think? Well, pretty specific to Chloe, I would think. In chapter seven or before that? Chapter seven. So. It's the Corinthian. Yeah. It's, it's a. But yeah, yeah. It's what? It's the Corinthians. So when he says, now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it's actually plural. And a lot of you know, commentaries and stuff will say this. The you is, is referring to everybody in the church. How do you know that, though? Co commentaries would usually say that. But also in the context, you could get that. No. How do you know it was from the Corinthians? Where does it say that? Because who is he writing to? He's not just writing to Chloe. He's writing to all the people of the Corinthians. Right. Corinth. Yeah, and it, it, Chloe is one of the, the, the leaders of the churches in Corinth, but he's writing to the church in Corinth, right? At the beginning of the yes. book. Right. He, right. That's why we know. And that's why it's important. That's actually a great point. It's why it's important to look at who is writing and who is he writing to. Well, let me ask you a question. Okay, sure. because usually what happens is you should read before. So I started at the beginning of the Bible, so I'm reading all of this stuff, and all of a sudden I'm now in Corinthians, and I didn't read what was before Corinthians. So is that going to give me a, is, is this going to flow like a book, or is this going to be like all over the place? So, okay, there's a couple ways to take that. There's a couple <laughs> things that go into the way that the scriptures were, were put together. So they're not put together chronologically. Okay. So I would say the chronological aspect is the Old Testament and the New Testament. The Old Testament, yeah, you need to know it in order to really understand what's going on in the New Testament. Because when the Gospels come around, there's a transition taking place. The Old Covenant is still alive until Christ dies and rise, rises again. So there's an interaction and a covenant changing that's the process that's going on that the Gospels historically write about but am i gonna find am i, am I gonna know about chloe i don't all of a sudden you, chloe just pops up now. <laughs> yes yeah no i agree um so there's and that's the thing when you you just have to choose when it comes to different people outside of the apostles and the authors you you'll have to take a moment and you'll have to study okay is there any other information about chloe somewhere else and i can tell you there's not that much information about chloe in the new testament Okay. There's little things that we have here and there, but overall, she is not a, an enormous character in it. But what we do know is we can imply if Paul is using Chloe's people as a reference for what's going on in Corinth, he trusts her. So she's obviously somebody that's faithful. If we were to just take Corinthians as a letter by itself, we can take her as somebody that's faithful to God, that he relies on to give him good information about what's happening there, that he can trust to gather information and to inform him about the occurrences of, of, the, of the city of Corinth and the things that are happening in that, time, or in that area, as well as the church. So she's a reliable resource, and her people are reliable resources. Does hey, that make sense? A, here's a question. 
did Paul or Chloe have a last name? So <laughs> last names weren't, aren't like today. So again, that, that's a, if we look back in history, last name came about, uh, I believe it was more in the, the middle ages where your occupation was your last name. So like, like Jesus, the carpenter. Yeah, it would be something along those lines, but that that's not what his would be. I mean, they don't really, he would be back then. It was more by location. Jesus Joseph of Nazareth. Of Arimathea. Exactly. Oh, yep. I see. yep. And so yep. it would be by location, Jesus of Nazareth. You know, I'm Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is teaching or talking to Jesus of Jerusalem. You know, like they would know the differences based off of those locations and those interactions. Chloe of Corinth. Yeah, I mean, it could be that. Um, or there would, and this is going to make it more complicated, Jewish <laughs> names versus Roman names. If you were a Roman citizen, you had a Roman name. Saul utilized his Greek, his Roman name, I should say, as Paul. Paulus is a Greek name. Saul is a, a Hebrew name. And so names were, were dealt with differently than they are today. Does that make sense? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. <laughs> so... Going again, going back to the question of who is he speaking with to in chapter seven? If you go to chapter one, verse two, he's writing to the church of God that is in Corinth. So he's writing to the whole church in Corinth, right? Yes. So when he responds with now concerning the matters about which you wrote, who is he referring to? Corinth. Corinth, right? Because right. you keep in mind as you're reading. And, and that's why I do this. If you, I don't know if you can see this, but at the top of my journals and stuff, um, you can see that I put names of those that are in that text that I'm reading. So mm -hmm. I can be aware of what the, the conversation is, is and who it's with in the text or about for that matter. So he doesn't change the names that often as, as to who he's speaking with um, or that he, if he's talking about somebody, that'll be one thing, but... Um, it's a rare time that he brings up somebody else to talk to them directly in a letter to somebody else or to a group of people. He'll point people out, but that's about it. So in this context, we can say, okay, so now they, it appears that the Corinthians have written a letter to him in response or not in response. They had questions about things. And so he's going to address those questions, right? So, mm -hmm. Do you think then if everything before this kind of was one big long thought about Chloe's people bringing something up, do you think that that could be one section broken and that we can break down into to big and smaller sections? Yeah. Like, yeah. So why don't we put first Corinthians? Well, don't want to do that. First Corinthians one ten to six. 20 as one segment so this is one one long section of chloe's people bringing up issues and he's responding to those issues does that make sense mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so then we have first corinthians 7 1 And when do you think, I mean, you, some of you guys have done this, some of you guys haven't. When do you think that this, this section ends? <clears throat> uh, when they go to idols. Okay. What? Chapter yeah. 8. Yeah. Okay. So it's, I don't know. Idolatry and true worship. 33. So do mm -hmm. you? Do you think that section, chapter eight is a new section or do you think it's under a sub, the subsection of qu questions that they had? Well, it's still under subsections that they had, but it's still a new section. Okay, because yeah, I'll throw it in there. There's a whole bunch of stuff about how everything was arranged and unmarried widows and just directions concerning marriage. So that was one whole section. And then it goes to offering food offerings to idols. So it stops at uh, 7, 
So then it goes to eight and then it goes food offerings to idols. All right. What else? And that goes from one, two. I feel like it would be more of nine instead of eight. Only because I feel like when he's still in the same section, he always says now about, now about. And then, so like, one of says concerning the unmarried, he says now about virgins. And then for eight, he says now about food. And then for nine, he says, am I not free? I don't know. It just seems so, like nine is. Uh... Now I'm gonna throw that back. So observations in the background. I, normally I would just put this as observations in the letter. So mm -hmm. now about is something that is, is repeated, Yeah. right? So we wanna throw that in our notations that if we see something like that repeated over and over again, maybe that's, that is a breakdown in how he's communicating. So what were those again? Um, so instead of seven, one to eight, or seven, seven one to 40. 40. Yeah, I feel like eight would be included in that. And then the new section would start at nine. But I don't know. So do you think the, are you saying that you would put, add a section in here instead of one through 40, you would put one to 24. Like yeah, I guess what are you, I thought you were doing a section, I guess this, you know how on top you have yeah, seven, one dash. If we were to cover all the grievances. If we yes. Were oh, you have a thing of grievances. So, yeah. yeah, so if we did, yes, and that's, I was looking at it more in a bigger picture, but it sounded like you guys wanted to go more narrow than that. So if we were to go more narrow, then yeah, we would have one to 24. And then seven. yeah, 725 through the end, right? To 40. Oh. Okay, so what's one through 24? Wait a minute. So one this. 24 is about marriage. And then 25 through whatever is about virgins. Unmarried and widows. Well, it says now about virgin, virgins on 25. Okay. So yeah, it's a little confusing there because it's gonna get into being betrothed and that's a, one of those cultural things, but yes. Marriage and widows about virgins. Okay, if we're going to break it down like that. So 8, 1 through 13, is that all one idea? But it's yeah. actually part of the other one because this one says unmarried and the widows, and you're talking about virgins. So, I mean, there's widows in the second, in that 25 through 40 also. Right. Did I, I'm, oh, I'm sorry. Let me put, I'm sorry, I, I mistyped this. I'll just put marriage there because it, it's all really referencing around that. Right. And then seven. Well, no, one through 24 is about marriage. Oh yeah, that's what I mean. So marriage. you just want to get rid of the, and then the second one is widows and virgins. There we go, sorry. I'm getting yes, all this no. stuff. Do you, what do you guys think? Does that cover it? Yeah, I, I mean, I guess it looks that way to me. Okay. Everybody good? Yeah. All right. So let's move on to 1 Corinthians 9. Well, again, my Bible says the rights of an apostle. Okay. 
Now, remember, again, those titles aren't biblical. Somebody put them in there. Is that what you would define that section as? Well, he does mention right several times in it. What was the, the issue? What's the question or the statement made in verse 13 of chapter 8? Therefore, if food is the cause of my brother's falling, I will never eat meat least I cause my brother to fail. So what's There's he saying? Not. What's he saying there? I don't know. <laughs> okay. Well, what he's saying is that the- Take care of the week. The what? Well, hold on, Deb. Deb, what were you saying? And then Larry, go ahead after her. He's saying that um, he is. It's a he is setting an example of himself to his brother. Is kind of the picture I get. Yes, therefore, setting. Okay. Therefore, yeah. Therefore, of what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin. I will never eat meat again. So I am setting the example to my brother so that he does not, so that he follows me and he will not fall, I guess. Okay, Larry, what were you thinking? I think he's saying for us to take care of the weak. Yeah, the idea here, the principle is, I, Paul will give up what he needs to so that somebody won't sin, right? right? He will give up his right to, to eat something so that someone else won't sin. Then he moves into chapter nine. Am I not free though? Am I not a, an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus the Lord? Are not my, you my workmanship in the Lord? And he, he begins to talk about rights as an impossible responsibilities that he has as, a, as, a, as an apostle that he gives up, that he should get, but you can see that there's a connection that he's drawing in the theme, the process of moving through the conversation, right? Okay, I'm going to ask a stupid question. It's not stupid, but go ahead. I know Paul was Saul, and he became Paul after Christ knocked him off his horse because of what he was doing. Did not Paul follow Jesus? Prior to that? Well, not pri not prior to being when he was Saul, he didn't follow Jesus. But after he got knocked off his horse and blinded, see, I, I do know the the story. And then was he an apostle of Jesus's? Yes. Yep. So there are stipulations to what it meant to be a, a, an original apostle, and then there were apostles that went around starting churches. The original okay. apostles had to see God. When you look in Acts, they, there's a list of Usually we utilize the list of qualifications to be an apostle in, at the beginning of Acts. Okay. One of which is this that is, they had to see Jesus personally. This is where I'm very confused because, you know, I, I'm, I'm jumping into this and I, as I said before, I wasn't required to read the Bible and I just started mm -hmm. reading the Bible. So to me, this is like just throwing, I, I, I don't know what Paul did when he was with Jesus, because we don't see that he mentioned Paul much in the, when he was teaching. Yeah, and it, so in the Gospels, we don't see Paul because in, it, his introduction wasn't until the beginning of Acts, when he okay. was Saul, and his first introduction was the stoning of Stephen. And he took glory and in, in pleasure in the stoning of Stephen because he thought Stephen was a heretic. Okay. And at this point, as a believer, He's here saying, you know, hey, I'm an apostle. I have certain rights. And just as, as is said, a lot of them are saying, well, Paul, can, Paul surrenders his rights for the sake of other people. For the, and ultimately, so that they would know the gospel. So his sacrifice is connected to this. His, his argument moves through beyond chapter 8 into chapter 9 to say, I have a, a plethora of rights that I give up for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of Christ and what he's done for me. I don't want to in any way inhibit somebody else's salvation. I don't want them to sin. 
I don't want them to be tempted. I'm going to do what's necessary to make sure that they're going to, to live right lives according to the gospel. So what we see is a flow of thought moving from chapter eight to chapter nine. The, and, and this is where the practice comes in. It's all about making observations and writing these notes down. It, so when you see these chapter breaks, for example, hearing him say, therefore, if food makes my brother stumble, I will never eat meat lest I make my, brother's, my brother stumble or sin. And then moving into this whole, like, almost like a side conversation of him having these rights and, and just this explanation of, I don't want people to sin. I will give up my apostolic rights that I've received in order to make sure that other people don't stumble and that they live right before God. Okay. All right. So it's a, it's a continuation of the letter and the train of thought. He's arguing for, as Larry said, dwell with the weak. Understand where other people are coming from. Underst uh, oh, 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 we have a guest. We have a guest. Oh, Hold on a second. Are. We've been blessed. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. Hey, sunshine. What kind of jammies do you have on tonight? Oh, oh it's a panda. panda. <laughs> nice. Where's your big sister? You won't believe what I just got. You won't believe what I just got. Big finger heart. Well, look at there's a little friend on for you too. Are you nervous? Yes. So just say goodnight. You don't have to say hmm. Can she see her? Yeah. She's being shy. Say hi. Can you see her? I don't know if you guys. Know. <laughs> <laughs> So, <laughs> wave goodnight. We're going to see her on Thursday. Can you guys see her? I don't know if you guys can. I can I, yeah, we can see her. All right. She's waving goodnight. Goodnight. Good night. Hi. Night. All right. See you, girl. Hugs and kisses. Hi. What? Yeah, the other one will be down shortly. So, the part of I think the part of the newness of this is making an example. And when my other one comes down, I'm sure she'll be really ecstatic. She's more the gregarious one than this one. So, um, but um, when it comes to studying these things, it it really it's where we have to slow down and we have to be willing to take notes and understand the connections between the paragraphs, um, which is what I loved about the homework. I don't know if any of you guys did this, but. When you guys read through the paragraphs, for example, when we get to chapters one through four, are you guys notating what's the relationship between each paragraph? No. No. So we will. But we will. Yeah. That's, that was from Mary. <laughs> <laughs> what, am I, what am I doing? So let's take an example like, like this. At the end of chapter eight, we saw, or in chapter eight, what we see is this concern about idols, right? Right. There's these meat markets uh, or these marketplaces where they go and get food. And when they get there, some of that meat is sacrificed to idols and they're eating that food that was sacrificed to idols. They're buying it and they're eating it. How do they respond to that? What, what is the biblical response? What should they do? How should a Christian handle a situation like this? Now, obviously in America, we don't go to the grocery store and there's idols to, you know, sitting set up in Walmart and you go to the idol you want, you buy the meat from that idol and you walk away. We don't have that. Well, we have our favorite brands. That's kind of an idol. <laughs> oh, true. <laughs> true. So in their case, the, the question was, am I sinning by eating this meat? And Paul's because response. Because it was sacrificed to an idol. Yes, Paul's response is, is, is yeah. multifaceted because he understands, well, really, there are no other gods. So, yes, you can eat the meat. It's fine. There's no other gods. Go for it. Oh, here's number two. Oh, matching jammies. <laughs> so, Jesse. So. Hi. 
Oh. 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 I lost two teeth, and when I ate it by the corn earlier, I found that my tooth got loose from it. Oh, no. Yeah. Wow. Tooth fairy. Yep. Now all I, I want like for Christmas. Because I get money. <laughs> Who says? The first tooth I lost, I got $5. $5? <gasps> oh, my gosh. I used to get a quarter. Only, that's no. only the first tooth. All of, the, all of them are a dollar after that. It's only, it's only good, number one. They go on sale. I still right? only got a quarter. Yeah. <laughs> right, <Tooth> exactly. <laughs> Tooth Fairy's quarantined, so she's her budget's going down. So yeah. <laughs> she can't get out much. Yeah. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Good night. I'm not sure you can look. Okay. See you in the morning. See you in the morning. Aw, that's so cute. We have a, a seek I have a secret with each of them, and my wife has a secret with each of them that we get to have to say before they go to bed. Oh. So, yeah. So, all right, let me throw this back in here so I can hear a little bit better. All right, cool. Nice little break there. Um. So yeah, so if we go to chap the end of chapter eight, we have these this conclusion that if somebody's around me, let's say somebody just got saved, they're immature, and they they believed in one of these other idols. You know, you remember there were the twenty six or twenty nine uh, temples around Corinth. They get saved and they're thinking, well, I have to eat. I I can't eat this meat. It would mean that I'm worshiping this other god, and culturally that obviously that would be an issue. But then Paul is trying to clarify this more thoroughly. And he's saying, well, if I'm in this circumstance, which for them was a legitimate circumstance, and I see this person, you know, that could be tempted to sin by thinking that it's okay for them to worship multiple idols, I'm, I'm not going to do this. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So then moving into chapter nine, he continues that train of thought but broadens it. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not my workmanship in the Lord? If, if no, um, or if, if to others I am not an apostle, at least I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who would examine me. Do we not have the right to eat and drink? Do we not have the right to take along a believing wife as do other apostles and the brothers of the Lord and Cephas? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard without eating any of its fruit? Who tends a flock without getting some of the milk? So he, you're, you start to see this kind of transition of thought to, I have these rights that I should be getting. You know, why, why shouldn't I get them? And then he, he continues, do I say that the, these things on human authority does not the law say the same? For it is written in the law of Moses, you shall not muzzle an ox while it tre when it treads out the grain. Is it, not, uh, uh, is it for oxen that God is concerned? So, you know, turning it on them again. The law states that I have these, these rights. And, you know, they're not for oxen. The, the, the point of that, that law was for us and me in this situation. Does he not certainly speak of for our sake? You know, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but the whole idea is the next verse in, in 12, nevertheless, we have not made a, a use of this right, but we endure anything rather than put an obstacle in the way of the gospel of Christ. So when, he, when Paul's thinking of the church, he turns this whole narrative, this whole question around of idol, idols, and he brings up this whole other topic of, I have rights that I could, I could desire of you guys. You guys should be paying me. You guys should be taking care of me. But am I asking for those things? No, because my concern is the gospel. I don't use my rights as a tool to get something I want. So he is not complaining. Nope. He's just I telling him what he, he should be doing, what he should be getting, and he's not. He's using, yeah, he's using what his rights are as a means of convicting them of what they're doing wrong. Mm, I see. They're saying, I have these rights. I can eat meat. 
I should be able to eat meat no matter what anybody says. Paul, yes. go ahead, Larry. Uh, no, I, just lost I think it ties into the beginning of the letter too, where he was commanding them to use him as the model of how you should be a Christian. Yeah. So here he's going in. I, I have all these rights. There's all these things I could do. I for, I, I voluntarily give them up in order to live in, in a holy way. So all these things that you've done, even though they may be your rights under Roman or Greek law you have to give these things up in order to truly be holy. Well, and, and, and as you continue the, the train of thought in verse 19, for though I'm free from all, I have made myself a servant to all that I might win more of them. And he continues to say, you know, I become all things to all men that I might win the more. So his, his ultimate point is no matter what the law is, whether it's Roman or in this case, you know, he's us utilizing the Jewish law no matter what it is, no matter what rights I have, I'm going to give up all my rights in order that I preach the gospel. And I don't put any hindrance in that. So if I could use a current day example of this, gun ownership, right? I have the rights to own my gun and I like having guns, but if let's say somebody got saved that was, you know, they were an activist and they got saved and they thought owning a gun would be sinful and wrong and they, they're confused over it. Well, maybe it's something that I should give up for the sake that, you know, if I see that this could be sinful in their life, something, some sort of temptation can occur in their life. I don't use my rights as a means to make myself get what I want because my goal isn't my, what I want. It's not my guns. It's not what I, my rights. It's their soul for the sake of the gospel. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. So is it like, is it like wanting to have the best margarita in the world in front of an, in front of someone you love that's an alcoholic and you refrain from that? Yes, but only on a spiritual level. So I right. mean that too, but yes, and on a moral level, yeah, that's present. If you're, if you have the heart and intent to preach the gospel, you'll do things to refrain from other, they refrain from doing things so that others may know Christ. You become somebody else in those circumstances by, by not ex like utilizing the rights I have in order to present truth to them. Like, Hey, like, let's talk about the gospel. Let's talk about Jesus. Let's not put a hindrance to what could stop you from knowing Jesus and then help them develop and mature and grow to an understanding. Well, Hey, Alcohol isn't a, isn't a sin in and of itself. Or, hey, meat offered to idols isn't a sin in and into itself because really idols are fake. They're statues made by hands. So there, there's a growing process and a maturing process that goes on within a believer. And we need to be willing to submit and say, hey, my rights are less important than your walk with Christ. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. And do you see how that train of thought transcends through the letter? Mm -hmm. Like he went and started about this question that they had about idols and used, turned, totally turned it around on them and said that, you know, I give up my rights so that the people around me can know Jesus, including you, including the Corinthians, right? Wow. Is that, is that making sense with how, how to go through the text? Yeah. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. So you, you, when you guys go through this, like this outline, for example, this overview, you know, let's, what, let's move ahead because I, I know we have chapter eight and we can continue on with this overview. Um, I'm going to, you have the one from the book. You have this one. Obviously this is mine personally. I'll put, um, my name here um just i gave mine as an example i didn't get as detailed in this as as we were going through um because uh, yeah for time but in this section so if we narrow it down to chapters one through four right part of the, ho the homework was to read through chapters one through four multiple times to write down a sentence or two that talked about what that 
section talked about. You know, to give you a, a summary of this paragraph talks about this. So I'll give an example. Um, I have mine color coded based off of these sections um, as I went through it. The greeting obviously is, is really verses one through nine as we talked about. Um, verses 10 through 17, be united at the cross. That was my summation of the, the paragraph. So when I look at 10, one, or 10 through 17, the whole point is uh, in verse 17, for Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel and not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. There's these divisions going on. And his whole point in the paragraph is don't be divided, be united at the cross. And I actually, just to clarify, I think that would be helpful. Don't be divided. 10 through 17. Yes. So, so and then the verses 18 through 25, the cross is the power of God to destroy and supplant worldly wisdom. Wait, quickly, what is the because? I'm, I'm going to get there. I'm going to oh, get there. Okay. So, that's the third step. So remember, the first steps are just write a sentence out about what that paragraph is about. A sentence or two. The next one is, so if I do that for, for that paragraph, verses 10 through 17, and then I move to 18 to 25, and for me it was that the cross is the power of God to destroy and supplant worldly wisdom. So, as he says the, for the, in verse 18, for the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the, the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? He continues on. And then he continues, um, for the foolishness of God is wiser than, the, than men and the weakness of God is stronger than men. So, and or verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. So it all centers on Christ being crucified as that wisdom that's being brought. And so the cross is what is going to destroy the worldly wisdom and it's going to replace it for those that believe. But, but then how is it that connected? So the first thing I look at is the first word in the, in the, in the paragraph. In verse 20, uh, 20, or no, I'm sorry, 18, what's the first word? For the message. For? For. For, right? Yeah. Or because? So I begin by to under, understanding the relationship between paragraphs with the first couple words or first word of the paragraph. Because in Greek it that word is a connector now it can get confusing based off of how many times it's used but that's a whole other thing but for the most part if they put it in the in the english it's a connector it tells us for example is the next paragraph supporting the thought kind of like a five point pair or five point essay right you write the thesis statement at the top of the first paragraph and then the three middle paragraphs are there to support the thesis in Greek, they have words that help you understand that. So for is one of those words. It can be one of those words. So the idea is verses 18 to 25 support verses 10 through 17. He's going to give the reasons why they shouldn't be divided. So in that sentence, you know, you can put, you know, whoop, didn't want to do that. Um, the, the, the support for comes in. So he's going to support his thoughts from of 110 through 17 in 118 through 25. So he's saying, because of these things, do this. Don't be d divided because of this. Here's my reasoning why. Does that make sense? Yeah. Now it does. But you won't be here when I do it later. <laughs> but that's why, and that's why it takes practice. That's why we're doing it now, and it should give you some thoughts on what to look for and how to do this. Okay. So, okay. 
So that's my, that, that, that's my connection. Okay. That's the way it, that when I look at this text and I look at the language and I read the commentaries, this is how these two are connected together. Were any of you guys able to do that here? Did any of you guys do that part of it? No, I admitted that. <laughs> I did it, but from what I was glancing at with what you had and what I had, it wasn't necessarily the same, but I didn't expect it to be. Yeah, yeah. And we did it partially. Okay. On it. We got it pretty pretty close. And Suzanne, what were you thinking? Um, we line up for the most part, but I wrote out way too much. <laughs> <laughs> and that's okay. I didn't it as much. <laughs> That's okay. And th this, the sum summation of it is just to help you get in that process. You don't move on from a paragraph unless you can put it in your own words. You know, really think it through. What's, what's trying to be said here? Don't move on until you get that paragraph. Are paragraphs, do they always have a connector word? No. Oh. Nope. So like an example of that would be, um, Where was that? Verse 14 of chapter 2. Let me see. Him. And it also, part of the problem too is different uh, Bible versions may have different paragraph breaks. Mm -hmm. So when you're, when you're doing something like this, it's helpful to have something like the NASB. That's a word for word translation. Mm -hmm because you get these breaks, they're trying to break it more related to the text itself. And so, and then, then you can go from there and say, okay, that's where the, the language break would be. You know, then you move into an ESV or an RSV or an NIV and you read through, okay, are the, why are these different? Why did they separate these if they did? Or if they're the same, you know, what's the thought? Because there are times when I'll put paragraphs together. Um, for example, uh, my greeting, I would put, or uh, not my greeting. There's another section that I put the paragraphs together because I think linguistically, I think they actually go together in the argument. Again, that's down the road. I'm not going to say just start doing that. But it gets you thinking at least at, in the direction of asking the question that, you know, how are they connected? So in verse 14, it says, the natural person does not accept the things of the spirit of God for they are folly to him. And he is not able to understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Prior to that, it says, and we impart in verse 13, and we impart this in words, not, ta not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit, interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. Do you think that those two passages are connected to each other? Do you, does it sound like the argument is still the same thing? No, because one minute he's telling that you, they, the man can understand the truths, and the next one he's saying they don't. <laughs> well, to me, that connects it. Because it's talking about just giving it's, wisdom to the spiritually minded, right? You see that connection there. Right. And so they are connected in thought, but what he's bringing up another point in per, pertaining to that issue. So these two thoughts are still together, but they're separate paragraphs. The idea in mind, for example, I have the, I'm looking at the ESV, for example, is that those are separate thoughts. Verse 14 is a new paragraph. Do you either, do any of you guys have something different? Yeah, in my NIV, they, it is not at all. It's the same one, right? Yeah, right. And I, I personally would think that that is more correct. That they should be one big paragraph. That verses 6 to 16 should be one. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Right. And these are the observations that you're going to make. But when you read in the English, to me, honestly, the ESV has a theological bias, and this is one of those. Mm. So because the, it, the translators are primarily Calvinist, Reformed 
Calvinists um, that they separate it because there's Calvinist uh, theological points that they try to make with this verse. I'd say rhetorically and contextually, no, it goes along with what's being said before this. And so you just have to think those things through and ask those questions. And that's why when you ask the question, Deb, like, hey, is there any verse or that doesn't begin with a connector? Sometimes there are. And you have, to, you have to spend the time understanding whether or not it should go there or not. You have to re you do the work with that to understand it better. But it doesn't take that long to get there. And I know that might seem frustrating and overwhelming that, hey, like these translations have these issues. But if you start thinking in, the, in more of the mindset of the author, like, hey, he's writing a letter. Would he really separate this from the, the previous sentence with where he's at right now? Is that his point? Is this a new train of thought? I would say no. And a lot of people like those that translated the NIV would agree. And that to me is refreshing because I'm like, okay, great. I'm not the only one that's thinking this way. You know, those that have been studying this have been thinking this way. And that affirms where I'm headed with this. Does that make sense? Yes. All right. So it's, it is eight. We can spend some time maybe using... I, I want to get into the application aspect of it because that's really part of this. And I know we did a little bit of that. Um, so why don't we do a practice? It, 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 does this section make sense to you guys now? Yeah, it makes a lot more sense to me. So, and sometimes writing it out like this, where you have the passages by paragraph, as you're taking notes will help you. So let's say in, in the month you're studying First Corinthians and next month you want to read through it and delve in it deeper, have a journal and just write out the, in, in the pages these verse numbers so that as you take notes on each page is a different paragraph and you can take notes of that paragraph as you read through it. Does that make sense? Right. And are you emailing all of this to us? I'll, I'll email this to you. Obviously, we didn't go through it as detailed. Um, but I will email this to you. Yes. Okay. So um, here were some of my thoughts on, on it. Um, you know, uh, I think, is it four? Or no, I won't get into it. But yeah, these are some of my connecting things. This is the way that my mind thinks it through. I, I, I'll just write a sentence. And as I said, I, I put it as, you know, a problem, then solutions, a problem, then solutions, or a problem, then a, a, si a solution or a, a side thought that maybe has nothing to do with it that he brings up. Paul does that sometimes. Um, or, um, so these are some of the thoughts that I had towards the text itself. Um, questions there? Are we good? Okay. And I'm actually going to put sixteen here and do this before I forget. I was meaning to. So the also has helped me remember what that first word is in the next section and what it means to the text, or the becauses or anything like that. Um, and I just I didn't get to the rest of these. That's why that that's a little blank, but. We'll, we'll spend a couple minutes doing going to the next principle um, and some things to think about when you're, when you're doing this. Is he talking to an individual or a group? How does it affect our application of the principle? And what is the principle itself? Uh, so I would, when you write these paragraphs out, when we get to the hermeneutic section, you might want another section in your notes saying, what's the principle? And even asking the, the question, does this apply to me now? So, because there's going to be times when it doesn't apply to us. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So, uh, let's see. A couple things to remember. A text cannot mean what it never, never could have meant to its author or readers. And whenever we share comparable particulars, similar specific life situations with the first century hearers, 
God's word to us is the same as his word to them. It's just remembering that the principle has to transcend time. So if it doesn't, if it's not capable of transcending time with what's been said, then it's not a principle that we can utilize now. So why don't we pick a passage and we'll try it out. And do, do any of you want to pick anything out from chapters one through four? If not, I can pick one out. Sure, pick one out. You want me to pick one out? Yes, please. All right. Um, let's see. Let's go to chapter four, um, verses one to five. So I'll read it real quick. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mystery and mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they be found faithful. But with me, it is a very small thing that I should be judged by you or by any human court. In fact, I do not even judge myself for I'm not aware of anything against myself, but I am not thereby acquitted. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, do not pronounce judgment before the time, before the Lord comes, who will bring to light the things now hidden in darkness and will disclose the purposes of the heart. Then each one will receive his commendation from God. Now, there's a lot in here, um, but let's, take, let's start at the beginning. What's the main idea here? If we could give it in a, a sentence or two. Faithful manager. Being a faithful manager. So what, what's the main, what does he want them to do from this in, in verse one? What's, what's the, the thought that he's trying to get across in verse one? He is servant of Christ. He doesn't want them to put him on a pedestal. Exactly. So don't regard us as something more than we are, right? Regard us as servants. So the idea here is regard. And ultimately because everything will be judged in the end, right? Yeah, but that'll work so his concern is their people's perceptions of him mm -hmm. and so okay the, the, he recognizes okay they're judging him in a in a in a sinful way they're they're obviously there's obviously some sort of contention between him and them based off of what he's saying here but he's trying to get them to see, you need to regard us as servants and nothing more. Because what, what were they regarding them, at, at, them as at, in verses 10 through 17 in chapter one? Do you guys remember? What? what was the big problem in verses 10 through 17 in chapter one? As gods. They were What did you say? They were regarding him as, as the Savior. They were, Mary said they were regarding him as the Savior. Okay, they were, they were dividing over who has the most authority. Okay, well, I got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So some were saying, I'm of Apollos. I'm of Paul. I'm of Christ. You know, you can just picture the arguments. I listen to Paul. I listen to Apollos. Oh, yeah? Well, I listen to Christ. I'm better than all of you. Right? That's, that's what's happening in the church. 
here's his response. This is one of his solutions to the division. You should have the right perspective of the apostles, right? Mm -hmm. So, now, if we were going to move this forward, now there's a couple things that we can apply here, but because of, of time, we're, we'll use this one. Who would we regard as our, that they're not apostles, but if we, if we were talking about this in the church today, how would we rephrase that principle? Pastors or elders? Yeah. So the current principle, or the time, timeless, I'll put timeless principle. Well, if I can write. Daily. Yeah. Um, so have the right perspective of church leaders, right? That's the principle he's trying to get across. The leaders that, that teach and that lead the church are what? Servants. They are, that's right. Regard them as servants. Don't look at them as high and mighty. They're there to serve you, not divide you. Sam, would this apply as well through like different sects of Christianity, like how they break up as Reformed or Lutheran or Baptist or, because it seems like that bickering that you're talking about still very much takes place. It, it does. Now, here's where the conundrum comes in with utilizing this. So now you start thinking about doctrine as a whole. How far do you go doctrinally before somebody is not right with God and they, they, you cannot dwell with them? Because the New Testament also talks about not even eating or greeting false teachers. So like somebody like Joel Osteen, for example, who teaches a gospel where you're there to get money. The, the, it's prosperity. You, you are here to to live your best life now, right? That's not, a bit, that's not a truth of the gospel at all. That leads people to think that they're gonna to live successful, peaceful, prosperous lives now just because they believe in Jesus. That goes contrary to many promises that Jesus makes. So what do we say about Joel Osteen? I mean, Paul calls out false teachers. So we begin to ask the question, well, is somebody preaching a false that preaches a false gospel and that has like Joel Osteen or calls sin good and good sin as Joel Osteen has? He's called homosexuality and sexuality good um, in interviews. Should, should we be abiding with a teacher like that? No, no. And so, and we should say, hey, Joel Osteen and anybody that aligns themselves with him is a false teacher. So I wouldn't honor them as a servant of the church of Christ because he's teaching a false gospel. And so it begins to lead in these questions where we take, we begin and, he, and he's even, the interesting thing is here, he, he's talking about being judged and the, the, even regarding them as servants draws these questions up and should draw these questions up of, how then should I regard my leaders? Well, they're servants of Jesus. There's division in the church. I should regard them as servants. Well, what's the divide? What's the black and white line? And what's the gray area that, I, that, can be, that we can all live in right. in order to make things okay? Like I would say Calvinist pastors like John MacArthur, John Piper, are or even some of the closest elders that I know that I have that I go to for wisdom are fully believers. Mm -hmm. Do we disagree on some of this doctrine? Yes, but we all belong to Christ. I, I disagree with some of the, their doctrinal stances on things, but that doesn't make them, in, and from what I can see scripturally, they believe by grace through faith in Christ. I'm, I'm not going to disassociate myself from them. 
So that, that would be a point where you set the bickering aside and, and you just come to the, the point where like, okay, we're, we're, we're brothers and sisters in Christ. Even though we have slight differences, we don't need to bicker and divide over this. Yes. Now, it also brings the question of, can I do ministry with them? Because the way that I would do ministry when it comes to counseling somebody about, let's say, losing their salvation because they lose faith, they reject the faith. I believe, and I, when I study scripture, I believe that you can reject the faith and apostatize. And ultimately, God will reject you because you've rejected him. According to every book in the New Testament talks about apostasy. They would say, no, once you're saved, you're always saved, period and their definitions of certain things are very different than me. So I don't want to cause confusion in the church. So I wouldn't serve in ministry with somebody that disagrees with me here due to the fact that we have differences and it would cause problems. Mm -hmm. And I'm not okay with that. Does that make sense? Yes. So when I use this principle and I look at something more personal, like, like Mount Zion, and I look at our leadership, like Dave and them, I'm not going to say, Hey, Bo, I'm, I like what Bo says and I'm aligned with Bo over so-and-so. Now, are there disagreements that I have theologically with some of them? Yeah. But are they, are there going to be some areas that we will disagree? Absolutely. If I found areas that I think would be doctrinally problematic where, hey, no, this is like false teaching, like this is a problem, there are biblical steps I can take that. But until that point, I regard them as servants. They will be judged and I will hold them account doctrinally, but I will serve them and, and keep unity within the leadership because they are all servants. I will not choose preferentially one over the other. And try to cause divisions because one, I think one person's better than another. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. Does this help move through the process of, you know, their division and what could possibly happen here and is happening in some regards and how, and how the principle is timeless? Mm -hmm. Right. Does that help? I, yes. I hear some, okay. All right. Yep. Good. Yep. Any questions about this? Is this, does this clarify some of the things that we've been going over when it comes to interpretation and, you know, hermeneutics and all of this stuff? Yeah. I'm glad we did it together as an example that made a huge difference for me at least. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, it is late. It's a quarter after. Um, I don't like holding you guys over. Um, does it, are you guys good? Are you guys, is the, is the mud in the water slowly separating into water and dirt? No. <laughs> no. All right. Yeah. It's becoming clear, more clear each week as we go through it. All right. Good. Well, I know next week is on, let's see. I think it's utilizing the old Testament in the new. So, um, yeah, the Old Testament narratives, their proper use. So it's actually the Old Testament. So um, be prepared for that, chapter five. Um, we'll dig into that. It's, again, remember, they're historical documents. They're, they're narratives. So there will be things. That, yeah, we'll get to it when we get to it. But um, there's no homework other than that. I would, other than just to practice what we've just done. And now that you guys will have this template, you know, continue moving through First Corinthians on your own just to try it out. And we'll hit up the overview of the Old Testament narratives. Okay, so just continue doing First Corinthians and then just read chapter five. Yeah, I would just do that because then it'll help hopefully help you with some of the practice in First Corinthians with what we have here. Okay, should we do like the next subgroup? Uh, first Corinthians, you know how we did like one through four? Should we do like four, like five through, you know what I mean? Like nine or? If you haven't done one through four, do one through four. If you have done it, move on. Okay. 
So, okay. and then we'll have a period at the beginning of the class to go over some of the things that you're doing. How's okay. that? I'll, I'll make yeah. sure that there's some time cool. in there. Okay. Perfect. Cool. Yeah. yeah. Anybody want to close this out? Yeah. I can. Okay. Go for it. Heavenly Father, I just thank you for bringing us all together tonight, Lord, and we just thank you for Sam and his persistence and patience with us and teaching us how to dig into your word, Lord. We just ask you to be with each and every one of us during this uncertain time that we're all in, Lord. Help us continue to learn and to dig into your word and to have patience with ourselves. Keep everyone healthy until we meet again next week. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Awesome, guys. Great job tonight. I know that it's a lot. Um, yeah, you're doing good. You're doing really good. Thanks, everybody. Yeah. Thanks. Bye. Bye. See you guys. Bye. 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 Bye.